Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm a sociologist. It's good to be here with you. Um, I'm very interested in this social media stuff. You know, there seems to be something to it. Uh, just like CB radio transformed our lives forever. Um, no, maybe not the best example. But uh, you, you get the idea that the idea of people talking to people uh, is certainly a very powerful one. And after 2011, I think we could all agree that 2011 was the year of the crowd and that crowds have shown their power. There's almost nothing you can't do when you and 150,000 of your closest friends get together. Uh, but for as many people have ever gathered in Tahrir Square or any of the Tahrirs around the world, orders of magnitude, more people have gathered in the cyber Tahrirs of the world, the online versions. More people mention Tahrir in Twitter than ever were in Tahrir. And so the question becomes, how can we begin to capture something of the dynamics or the shape of the crowd when the crowd is not a physical crowd, but a virtual crowd? And so my organization, with my colleagues, we've been working on tools that make it easy uh, to take a picture of a crowd in cyberspace. Think of us as the Kodak Brownie camera of the online world. Um, we intend that metaphor in that we, we also want to serve users who are not themselves software developers. And so let me just ask the question, how many coders are in the room? Any software developers? We have one, two, three, okay. So a few software developers, the majority of us still, myself included, not a software developer. Uh, but let me ask another question. How many of you feel comfortable uh, if you're tasked with make a pie chart? Anybody here okay with the pie chart task? Me too, me too. I present to you today a mechanism by which you can make a network chart if you can make a pie chart. And so we have created a tool. We call that tool Node Excel. That's a picture of it back there. And if you are already in Excel, we are a short step away from your comfort zone. Uh, Node Excel is an acronym because we're very geeky people. And therefore, it stands for the Network Overview Discovery and Exploration Add-in for Excel. Legal counsel also told us that you cannot trademark an acronym. And so we believe them. Um, so what we have done is built a free and open application, an add-in for Excel. You can get it on the web. I'll show you where that is. But if you use your favorite fine quality search engine product and type in the word Node Excel, N-O-D-E, letter X, letter L, we're the one and only Node Excel on this planet at the moment. And therefore, uh, let that be a lesson to all of us who are branding, uh, have a unique term. So you can't help but find us on the web if you type in Node Excel. And so what has happened is, uh, well, what happened was I worked at Microsoft for about 10 years. And at the end of those years, this project was active. And we, as an experiment, made it an open source project. And then I moved to California and realized that I, I can't leave. And uh, that at that point, my relationship with Microsoft ended. And uh, the project didn't. And in fact, while I was active in the project at Microsoft, we had attracted many academics and other contributors from around the world. And when I left, we saw no reason to stop. And so we didn't. And now we have many members from many time zones. We think 14 time zones now. Uh, people at the University of Porto in Portugal, at Oxford University in Oxford, Cambridge University. Uh, we have folks at uh, Yongnam University in Korea, uh, here at Stanford University. Uh, also at Cornell, the University of Maryland. Uh, we have a developer in Seattle, and we have people who are contributing from uh, the Australian National University in Canberra. So we never meet. But we, we do send a lot of email to each other. And this organization, the Social Media Research Foundation, has been created as an umbrella organization to, to maintain this software, the Node Excel software. And we have a motto. Uh, and our motto is, you'd be surprised what happens when you put so sociologists in the same room with a computer scientist. Um, and so we have drawn in a lot of people from a variety of disciplines. 
uh, a good chunk of whom are not coders, are not algorithmists, are not mathematicians. They're social scientists, and they have questions, but they tend to have certain disabilities. Like myself, they are not algorithmic. They're not going to sit down and hack some R code for you. Uh, they're not Python developers. They're not C Sharp developers. Uh, what they are are theory and story developers. They're data analysts, but they're not coders. And so what we've done is mush together the non-coders with the coders, and the result has been a tool that anybody can use. Anybody who can write, uh, who can make a pie chart. And so we've lowered the threshold for access uh, to, to skills that most of us have. So uh, you'll find that I am in a lot of places in social media, trying to walk the walk and, and post the post and blog the blog. And um, that the interesting thing about social media is that it's hard to get away from it. We are all in it. You've probably sent somebody an email today, even if you did not write a blog post. Uh, and that at the core of all of this social media is a single data structure. And this is handy because these are otherwise very, very different kinds of services, blogs, wikis, YouTube, Facebook, Flickr, all of these things very different from one another. But there's one thing that they all have in common. They all form networks. They all form con collections of connections. They form graphs, connected entities. And so what we're trying to become is the browser for that. Now, you probably have heard of Firefox and you probably have heard of HTML. But if I say that our aspiration is to become the Firefox of GraphML, that might not immediately be an obvious metaphor. So I should tell you first what GraphML is. Uh, well, it's got the magic letters ML in it, so it's a markup language, it's XML. And not unlike HTML, it represents the structure of something. But unlike HTML, instead of the shape of a page, it's actually the shape of a network. And so in GraphML, you might store information like um, A has a relationship with B, and this is what we know about A, and this is what we know about B. And if you have such a file, you could store that information in a GraphML file. If we were the Firefox for GraphML, then that would mean that we were free and open and available to all, and that we were a simple and easy way to browse collections of connections. And that's our aspiration, that we would be this free and open tool that everybody would turn to once everybody starts to realize, wow, networks, they matter. And I think most of us are starting to realize networks matter, but we have a challenge. Where do I get a network, we might ask. Where would I put it? How would I analyze it? What would I draw it in? How would I convey some insight about that network to another human being? And so our goal is to do just that, that we are going to deliver this tool that will take as few numbers of clicks as possible in the same way that few of us now sit down and think, I've got to get the manual for web browsers. I've got to read the manual for how to use a web browser. Most of us are now at the point where we simply grab a browser and start clicking on things. That's what we would like for you when it comes to networks. So what have we done? Uh, we have built uh, some open tools. We have a motto. We have a few. Uh, one is uh, that our goal is to generate open tools, open data, and open scholarship. That we need for there to be a toolkit out there that is open and free and not beholden to any particular set of interests. Um, I think you'll note that there are all sorts of tools out there for proprietary systems, let's say like LinkedIn. LinkedIn will draw you your LinkedIn graph. And that's very nice. It's a beautiful graph, the InMap project from LinkedIn. But it does not generically work for all the graphs you have. It won't look at your own email. It won't look at your Facebook graph. It won't look at your YouTube graph. It won't look at your Twitter graph. So we want a generic tool that will do just that. And so we have built this tool. Uh, it's out there on the web. You can download it. And if you're an Excel user, there's a good chance that in about five or 10 minutes, you're going to be looking at graph. You're going to be getting some insights from some connected structure that you perhaps didn't even realize you had, like your own, oh, it says I should be here. I'm glad I got here on time. Uh, so this is a list of all the data sources that we have built a bridge to. We paved the path. There are graphs out there all over the place. In fact, one of the things that I hope will happen at the end of today is that when you go out into the world, you're going to see it a little differently. Uh, you will think link. 
you will think about the world as a collection of connected structures. There's the power grid, the internet grid, there's the network of investments of which uh, startups got funded by which venture capitalists. Uh, we could all walk down Sand Hill Road and, and sort of build that graph as we go along interviewing people. So there are many kinds of connected structures in the world. Most of us were not trained to see them. We did not, we, you know, I've got two kids, in, uh, one in high school, one in middle school. At no point do they ever introduce the concept of network, of connected graph. You know, they, they finally start using words like vertex and edge, but it's geometry. They're talking about triangles. Triangles are wonderful geographic structures, but they're not networks. They're tiny networks anyway. So what we were trying to do is build a tool that will easily gain access to sources of network data that matter to you, your Facebook graph the Facebook graph for the fan page that you care about, your Twitter hashtag, your graphs, your email. Uh, we've also created a tool for open data. There's now a web page that you could think of as Flickr for networks. We call it the Node XL Graph Gallery. And you'll find it on the web at nodexlgraphgallery.org. And I'll take you there in a couple of seconds. But a lot of people will say, well, I'm interested in networks, but I don't know where to get one. And the spigots, the data providers, maybe does not provide them with what they need. And so we say, well, look, we have a, uh, a shopping uh, gallery. We have, we have a, a supermarket. You can get your trolley. You can go along and you can find a graph that you like. You can download it. You could be looking at it on your system in a matter of clicks. By featuring other people's network analysis, our goal is to socialize expertise to show people what the best practices are in network analysis, and then to make that data, and more important, the DNA of the graph available. So I'll show you a feature in Node Excel that allows you to say, I like this person's graph, but I don't care about their data. What I like is the way they've crafted the graph, the way that they have set certain attributes, the picture, the size, the color, the shapes. And I would like to extract that the DNA of the graph and apply it to my own. And in doing so, we've made it so that you can go and find the most expert user of Node Excel and steal their expertise in a digital file and apply it to your own graph. We initially started with the idea, the hope that we would teach people Node Excel. And we've learned that that never really was our goal. Our goal was to teach network science, to provide people with the ability to get network insight. What was stopping them was the fact that, like any tool, there are about 180 switches, dials, knobs, and levers that you should switch in Node Excel to get it to work. And uh, that's annoying. <laughs> and so we don't do that anymore. You can now get a graph that you like and apply the DNA of that graph to any graph you have and not have to go through the learning curve. We think that at that point, you'll probably come up with a little refinement and maybe you'll pass that DNA back into the gene pool. You can upload your graphs to the graph gallery. So it is a way of uh, socializing expertise and uh, knowledge about graphs. We've also been working on open scholarship. Uh, we are pleased to announce that WebShop 2012 has been funded by the NSF and that we will go ahead with 45 graduate students and 20 faculty at the University of Maryland in August. Um, and we will focus on all of the things that are happening around the notion of collective action in social media, technology-mediated social participation, the fact that encyclopedias are now written by swarms of people. Wikipedias are born, but more than Wikipedia. All the knowledge that gets assembled after a disaster or around the fandom for a novel or other cultural object, all of this is a collective effort. And we want to study those collective efforts because they seem to be defining. They are setting the agenda from politics to the economy, groups of people getting together and expressing their will is becoming easier and easier and more and more consequential. There are several people no longer employed because of this. Um, I'm thinking about Mr. Mubarak right now. But. So uh, open scholarship is an important part of our approach. We are publishing on the topic, and we seek collaborators who want to use the tool and apply it to their domain and come up with insights and show that studying the structure of things matters as much as the volume or change in size of uh, a phenomenon. 
And so we've been producing a lot of papers out there. Uh, we're also very interested in federating the use of the tool. We want uh, departments and businesses around the world to use the tool and then aggregate the data through this graph gallery. In doing so, we could perhaps map Twitter using the resources of mere mortals. Uh, we are not a big data shop. I am not Google. We are just a bunch of academics with a very modest budget. But working together, we might be able to take enough snapshots of whatever is happening in Facebook and Flickr and Twitter that day that years from now, we'll have some artifact. We'll have some way of looking back on our own history that is not exclusively owned by proprietary um, corporations. Uh, right now, what happens on Facebook is on Facebook, and it's Facebook's to curate and control. Uh, we'd like to take little tiny bites of it and grab it and put it in our own archive and make that publicly accessible. 20 years from now, we'll all be very interested in what that 2012 election was like and this thing they called Twitter. Do you remember Twitter? No, I don't. Re they had this thing called Facebook. Don't, doesn't ring a bell, they'll say. Um, I'm sorry for the Facebook stockholders, but you know, remember Friendster? No, you don't. Neither do I. Uh, these things will come and go, uh, so it'd be nice to archive some of the data now. And so we take some inspiration from the Allen Very Large Telescope Array. Uh, they've reached the point where no single radio telescope could get any bigger. And so what they've done is instead network 1,400 of them together. And so uh, collectively, they have the resolution power that is larger than any telescope on Earth, even though they're made up of individual telescopes that are much smaller than the largest telescope. So let's talk about social media. Social media is inherently social. Uh, it's also well, media, but uh, it's also inherently about giving something from one person to another. It's about sending that email, clicking that link, forwarding that email. It's about liking and linking, and all of that is social. It's about relationships between people. It's not about relationships between you and machines. Uh, and interestingly, every time you do any of that stuff, you leave footprints in the sand. And I'll note that silicon, in its raw form, is an inscription medium. Uh, and that if you were to process the silicon into a CPU, it becomes even better at storing these footprints in the sand. After all, in about eight hours, the tide will come in. It will wash all the footprints away. Whereas eight hours from now, nothing will wash the data centers of Google and Facebook clean. They will retain every click and every search you make. Uh, probably until they're purchased and put out of business by some other larger entity uh, at some point in the future. But right now we have these patterns. They're being left behind. They could be analyzed and they do tell a story. We could just look at these footprints and tell a story. We know which way they went, how long ago it was or how long it could have been. We know whether or not they came alone or in pairs or did they drag anything with them? Did they come with uh, vehicles or animals with them? There's a story to be told here. And there's another story to be told using all of these things. These are the internet verbs. These are the actions we are taking, I believe, many times a day without even thinking about it. Uh, these are all the ways that we can connect to each other on the internet. And uh, the, the like, link, reply, rate, review, favorite, friend, follow, forward, edit, tag, comment, check in. There may, in fact, be others, but I, I think that's a pretty exhaustive list. Um, these are all the things that we're doing all the time, and every time you do that, an edge is born, a connection between two entities, you and that other person, you and their document, perhaps. And so my goal for you is to think link. Uh, think about all those ties and how they connect A to B. Uh, how I reply to your email, or I liked your photo, or I linked to your website. And there are then re results, all sorts of different structures, different kinds of relationships between us. So some of these relationships are strong ties. And these are the closest relationships we have with friends and family. These are the people who will meet you for dinner on a holiday evening around your dinner table, maybe their dinner table. The sociologist Barry Wellman once said that you know about as many people as you could put around your holiday dinner table. And those are the strong ties. These are the people who you will attend their birthdays, you'll go to dinner with them, you'll call them if you haven't talked to them. These are strong relationships. What are those? These are strong ties. 
Well, those are uh, ne ne next level of answer. What am I looking at? Oh, those are links from a metal chain. So those are strong ties. Oh. Yeah. In contrast, these are weak ties. There you go. Weak ties, and and the, the idea of a weak tie is that this is someone you don't know all that well. But um, weak ties are easy to have, and Facebook is filled with them. It's hard to have 750 strong ties. It's relatively easy to have 750 weak ties. Uh, many of us have that many friends in Facebook. You have 200 followers in Twitter. Uh, none of those people are likely to be at your dinner table on holiday night. They're not your strong ties. They're weak ties. And there's been a lot of critique out there about how we're mistaking Facebook friends for friends, that they're not really friends. And indeed, weak ties are not strong ties, and it, we shouldn't make that mistake. But sociology does make this suggestion, that there is strength in weak ties. And in fact, um, right here at Stanford, Mark Granovetter, professor of sociology in 1972, wrote a paper entitled, the strength of weak ties, in which he showed that it's your weak ties who actually bring you new resources. Because the people you know well, your strong ties, already know everything you know. They live where you live, they work where you work, they pretty much don't have news for you. This is why dinner conversation tends to veer towards celebrities and sports. There's nothing else to talk about. But you go to a conference, you meet people that you only meet once a year, twice a year, these people have news for you, and they're willing to share it. And part of that news is, hey, did you hear that so-and-so is hiring? And Granovetter found that, unlike what he thought was going to happen, he thought your strong ties get you a job. What he found was that your weak ties get you a job. And so what I think we can say of the internet is that it is a powerful mechanism for the amplification of weak ties, and this is why there is no employment problem in America today. No, not quite. doesn't work that way, does it? But it does mean that you can amplify the power of all of those acquaintances you have. You can get some strength out of your weak ties. And indeed, it's the people who know how to use those tools who, it turns out, do not have an employment problem. If you are already in LinkedIn, your unemployment rate is half of the national average. People who know how to network know how to get employed. So networks, let's talk about networks. Networks have been around since time immemorial. The first primate to pick nits off of another primate formed a network, the grooming network. But social network analysis is actually from about 1932. And there's a guy named Jacob Moreno. He's a Romanian. He comes to the United States in the 30s, goes to NYU, and he starts creating this body of work at the time. He calls it psychological geography. He then changes the name to sociometry. He then tells his graduate students that the Almighty talks to him personally. Mm -hmm. This creeps out the graduate students. It ends social network analysis for about 30 years. <laughs> In the mid-1960s, network analysis starts to come back. And Starting in about the 80s, when social scientists get their hands on IBM PCs, suddenly the computational burdens, and they're significant, of doing network analysis goes away and we have this renaissance in network theory. So we have a second renaissance now because so much of our lives are in these things we call social networking services. Facebook, Flickr, YouTube, LinkedIn, all of these things form social networks. They call themselves social network services, but even things that don't call themselves social network services create social networks. Your email forms a social network. Who replies to who is a graph. And so what we have been doing is building tools that extract these edges, these connections, out of all sorts of data and make it really easy to draw them. And so this was a map made uh, about three weeks ago. This, there was a conference here in the valley called Strata, the Strata Conference. The O'Reilly and Associates Company put on a series of conferences. And this was about the topic of our era Big data. Big data. What do you do when you've got a couple of petabytes? 
you know, terabyte here, a terabyte there. Soon enough, you're talking about real data. Uh, you know, a terabyte is now $89 at a Best Buy if you can find one that is still open. Uh, it's not that hard to buy a terabyte. It's a little harder to buy a petabyte. That's a thousand terabytes. It's a little tougher to get an exabyte. That's a thousand petabytes. But you know, there are some people not far from here. They're spinning a few petabytes, I'm sure. Um, maybe a few exabytes. And they are mining this data. And this was a conference about mining that data, the Strata conference. And when people go to these conferences, particularly geeky people going to geeky conferences, what do you do when you go to a conference these days? You're going to tweet about it. You're going to use Foursquare and you'll check in. I just checked into this venue. I wanted to let everybody know I was here. I might tweet. In fact, I did tweet. I said I was coming to the Media X program to give a talk. Uh, maybe some of you retweeted it. I think, did you retweet me? You can thank you. Uh, and so these retweets, the, all of this Twitter activity taking place around an event, it has a shape. That's the shape it left behind while people talked about the Strata conference. There are all of these dots. These dots are people. The squares represent their, uh, their Twitter profile photo. So we go off to Twitter, we grab their faces, and we put them on the screen. And then we make them larger or smaller, depending on some attributes of the people in the crowd. In this case, it's how many followers have they got. So that's one measure of importance of prominence in a network. But network theory offers us different definitions of prominence. It has this very rich notion of the concept of centrality, of being at the center of things. In fact, it has four or five or six definitions of the word centrality. Do you mean being center in the terms of having the most number of connections? We call that popularity or degree centrality. It, people with lots of followers tend to have lots of connections. But there are other notions of centrality. Imp more important notions of centrality, like how much are you the only person that might span different clusters? We call that betweenness centrality. You might want to call it bridge centrality. We can call it anything we like. And so one of the things that shows up clearly in this network is that there's this smiling fellow there. Anybody recognize that guy? You know who that is? That's Mr. O'Reilly himself, Tim O'Reilly, not the other guy with the name O'Reilly. Tim O'Reilly. And he is perhaps one of the greatest masters of social media with thousands upon thousands of followers. His tweets are heard far and wide. He is clearly a good example of what social media influence means. He's built a whole business on the back of social media. But you see that little dot up there? It's that the confluence of all those lines? That's the account for the Strata conference itself. It's the Twitter account called StrataConf. And when you do network analysis, it shows up as more important than Tim O'Reilly. And that, we think, is a trick that network theory can do that other kinds of approaches cannot do. It can find where people sit within a set of relationships, and it can identify that some of those positions, I like to call them strategic locations, People who occupy a strategic location are influential. And not just the people who look like Tim, who have a lot of connections. Sometimes people have the right spot on the landscape. And even if they don't have a lot of followers, they have influence. So yes, some people are hubs. They are at the center of many connections. But hubs are not the only very important location to occupy in a graph. Some people could have. For example, two connections, while a hub has 200. And those two connections might be worth more than the 200 connections. So for example, they might be a bridge, our bridge. I like showing this picture around the world. It's always nice to say, our bridge. Uh, and you know, it only has two points of contact, right? Marin and San Francisco, it really doesn't go anywhere else. But you don't want to remove this bridge. It would be a very bad thing for tourism. It also makes it much harder to get to wine country. So bridges are important even if they aren't all that well connected. They're strategically located. So we could also look into social media and we could see that there are enormous crowds forming. This is a picture of Occupy Wall Street from last week. Actually, no, 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 I got that wrong. This is Occupy Union Square from 99 years ago. 
It's almost 100 years. 1913. Several things to notice about this picture. One, people wore hats. Very important. Number two, um, they are clustered. This is not a monolith. This is not a regiment. They are not lined up in rows. They are clumpy. And they are clumpy, and you can tell how they are clumpy because they are standing under a sign. I believe that by standing under a sign, they are declaring, I am the kind of person who could read this sign. Because these signs are not even all in English. They're in Italian, they're in Yiddish, they're in German. Some of it is in, is in English. And of course, why are they in Union Square? Because Union Square was not for the kind of union they wanted. They were in Union Square, a square dedicated to the, we still have a union, i.e. we won the Civil War, not union as in you have the right to self-organize. And what are they protesting? They want the right to self-organize. They want the right to unionize. And so crowds matter, and the clusters within these crowds really matter. And crowds still matter. There's Mr. Obama with one of his crowds. And the shape of the crowd, no doubt, tells him a great deal about the nature of the population in front of him. But today, no matter how big a crowd Mr. Obama can attract, the crowd of people talking about Mr. Obama is larger online. More people say the word Obama than ever will attend an Obama rally. And in fact, there is Mr. Obama pointing at the tweet stream of tweets containing the word Obama. And I believe it was at this presentation that he uh, proposed a massive multi-billion dollar federal funding initiative for the research into networks around social media. No, he didn't. But <laughs> wouldn't it be a, a, a sure path to American competitiveness? Um, so our approach is to say, well, look, you know, this Obama tweet stream is actually damaging the underlying nature of the data. It doesn't look like that. It's not a line. It's not linear. In fact, it looks like this. This is the Obama tweet stream from that day, on that date. We took a chunk of those tweets and we ran them through Node Excel, And we can see that the crowd actually has a shape. We know that this dense block of people, they have many connections with one another. They are conservatives. They are opponents of the president. The blue and green chunks or clusters, these are subgroups, they are at least, they are essentially the mass media and liberal supporters of the president. These folks over here, they're isolates. They don't have any connections to anybody. And that proves that the president is a brand because two people could talk about him who don't know each other. In contrast, I can show you many maps of topics. In fact, we could go back and look at the Strata Conference. How many isolates are in the Strata Conference? And so that would be to look over here and see how many of these folks don't have connections to somebody else. It's about 1% of the population. In other words, if you said the word StratoConf, the probability approaches certainty that you follow, friend, reply, or mention some other StratoConf mentioning person because nobody knew about StratoConference unless you were in the crowd. You already were part of the in-group. There was no out-group at Strata Conference. It's, you know, the usual suspects. By comparison, lots of people talk about Obama and they don't necessarily know each other when they do it. And that's shown here, isolates. And this allows us now to map lots of topics. We can go into Node Excel and we can ask it to extract all sorts of pictures. Pictures of uh, political party names, brand names, uh, hashtags, keywords, events, candidates, anything you like. Now there, is a, uh, there are many other tools. Uh, there is a very popular tool out there in Java. It works on all sorts of platforms. It's called Gethy. Uh, it is one of the finer quality tools out there. It's also a little challenging to use. They, they have a motto. They declare themselves to be the Photoshop of graphs. We have a motto. We declare ourselves to be the MS Paint of graphs. We want to be simple enough that you don't need the book. Although, I really should point out, there is a book and it is available. You should really get the book. Buy two. Uh, so there's Node Excel. It suddenly just adds graph pane, a whole bunch of knobs and dials that make it easy to get at a connected structure. And when we do this, we are now empowered to gain some insights into things that are happening in social media that are otherwise very difficult to grasp.
even if you read all the messages, if you read all the tweets, you would not see the social structural distinctions between different kinds of groups in social media. We don't all tweet alike. Not all hashtags are the same. And so here, uh, last November, New Scientist asked me to produce some maps for them and we generated an article. And in it, it's a comparison of on the same day the hashtags were Tea Party versus Occupy Wall Street. And there's a distinction. I don't think that you have to be network theory people to look at these two things and say, well, the shape looks different. And indeed, the shape does look different. And there are measurable, empirical, and quantifiable ways of contrasting these two communities of people and say of them, they have different social structures. So for example, how many isolates are there in the Tea Party graph? How much of a brand is Tea Party, at least as contrasted with Occupy? And we find that Tea Party people pretty much are all friends with Tea Party people. And that there isn't a brand-like quality in which people who are not already a member of your tribe talk about you. And so in order to be a brand, people who have not already married you have to be willing to talk about you. They have to say your name. There has to be awareness. And so if you look at something like Toy Story, lots of people say Toy Story. It doesn't mean that they have a relationship. And they don't have to know the animators or know the distributor in order to say the word. But it looks like with Tea Party, if you're not already in, you're out. And there aren't that many people on the out. There's nobody in the lobby milling around waiting to get in. Contrast that. Look at Occupy. Occupy Wall Street. Tons of people, about 18% of the total population, just say in Occupy Wall Street not related to other people inside Occupy Wall Street. That means that they've attracted a crowd. They've attracted a group of people who are willing to talk about them without necessarily already having made a commitment. Second thing to note, lots of hubs in the Occupy graph. It's essentially what it claims to be a bunch of self-anointed entrepreneurial leaders who stand up and begin to bring their audience to the topic. Each of them has their own little audience around them. In contrast, Tea Party is essentially really, there's the Tea Party, yes, Tea Party, but we really like Ron Paul, and left-leaning people who enjoy provoking right-wing people. That's this group. These people come in and say mean things to the right-wingers, and you know, I, I can't say that I support that. Yeah, I think you should talk nicely. But these people don't talk nicely at all. Uh, but they are densely connected, but there's a division, and there's a Pauline group and a Tea Party group. So these maps start to tell us some stories. They give us the tools of network analysis. They let us start thinking about things not as individuals, but as occupying locations within webs of relationships. And the great thing about the net is that those webs of relationships are no longer the kind of thing that you collected by interviewing people with a pencil and paper and ask people questions that they are not designed to answer, like who did you talk to yesterday? Most of us cannot remember. Most of us cannot remember what we had for breakfast yesterday. We certainly will answer the question. We will answer it with what we think is the aspirationally correct answer. I talked to the most important person I know yesterday. And so we know there are systematic errors in the way that people self-report their network relationships. But now we don't need that. We have the data. We have the fact that your cell phone, your email, your Facebook, your Twitter, your YouTube behavior is all machine readable. And while some of it's private and it should stay that way, you have access to it. You have access to all that data. And that, that then gives us a language, a way of talking about where are you within a connection, within a web of connections. So uh, another example, I'm going to go past this. and uh, This is another political topic. This is people talking about the GOP. Guess who's who? Uh, what I find disturbing about political discussions in Twitter and elsewhere in social media is not that the sides are very energetic, it's that there's very little connection between the two sides. And so my concern, as admittedly a very blue-colored person, is <coughs> not that we will become more blue or they'll become more red, but that there is no purple. 
There is no common ground. And that what we really need is a new discourse of purple talk. I mean, maybe we just can't agree on a lot of things, but we've got to be able to agree on something. What are those things? Let's find that purple middle ground. Uh, we've been building these pictures of lots of different topics, and so now it, it's not just a matter of having looked at one or two. We've now looked at uh, about 180,000 of these things, and uh, taxonomy is emerging. That we can actually say, ah, yes, this is a brand. This is a community. This is a polarized debate. And we can do that without actually reading any of the content, which, you know, you should read some of the content, but reading the content alone will not solve your problem. It won't highlight the fact that the tweets that you're getting in the GOP tweet stream actually break out into two clusters, which really can only be perceived accurately through network analysis. So um, this is the pattern of relationships between sen senators in the United States Senate in 2007. If two senators voted yes on the same bill, they got a link. If they connected with another senator more than 66% of the time, we let the link stay because every senator was connected to every other senator at least once because they vote on things like resolved. Kittens are cute. Most of us agree. There are some people in you know, the far extremes that have differences of opinion, but most of the time they can agree. But when you set the threshold higher, when you say, look, I, I only want to see people who agree two-thirds of the time or more, two clusters very quickly emerge, and that, of course, would be East Coast and West Coast. No, no, that, that, of course, is uh, right wing and left wing. This is 2007. Remember, back in 2007, there was some other guy who was president. Uh, there's Mr. McCain. There is Senator Obama. And then the three Republicans, who were the only three uh, to be in the middle, they are the between Republicans, uh, they were the only three who, in two years uh, later, voted for the Obama stimulus. That was Specter, Snow, and Collins. Of course, Specter was immediately voted out, and uh, was it Snow or Collins who just said that she's going to resign? I think it was uh, Olympia Snow. So two out of three gone. Um, some people say, is it good to have betweenness? And I like to argue it all depends. Often, if you are highly between, it means that you have arrows in the back from both sides. So it's not always a good idea to be between. Uh, so there is a book, and that follows on this breakaway bestseller. Uh, we've been doing a lot of things to make m making network maps easier. So this is a typical image of a network map. It's the way that many tools will make a network map for you. We have a one-button solution that will turn it into this. Uh, to make it so that it will lay out the graph in a way that is more comprehensible. We have a target. It's the number of seconds a human must spend on a graph before it's good enough to get an insight from. Target is set at zero. We don't want humans involved at all. We want you to get the graph at the end, look at it and say, yes, I understand. I can do this or do that with this image. We do not think that your time should be spent clicking and dragging these nodes into a particular location. So using Node Excel is pretty easy. You go to Excel, you go to the Node Excel menu, and for example, let's say you want some data, you go to the data import menu, and it gives you this menu, and we have a list, and there's all sorts of data out there that you can get networks extracted from. You can get it from your own email. If you're on Windows, we'll read your email. Uh, if you're on Exchange Server, we'll read your entire company's email uh, with appropriate permissions. Uh, we'll get Facebook and Flickr and Twitter and YouTube networks. Uh, coming soon will be networks that are extracted from Google+. So wherever there is a network, we're interested in going there to get it. Um, and when you get it, you, you get a dialogue that looks like this. And it says, what do you want to know about? This is go get me all the tweets on a topic and then find me all the connections among the people who tweeted on that topic. And it enumerates, well, what kind of relationships do you want there to be among them? Is it okay if one follows the other? Yes. Let there be an edge, a connection. A follows B. They both said a topic name. They follow each other. But they might also reply or mention one another. So we'll build edges for these different relationships. And when we do that, the result is a spreadsheet. You get a spreadsheet. 
you get column A and column B, column one, column two, and it's basically this person had a relationship with this person, and it was a relationship of type something. It happened on a date. This was the payload. It's the actual tweet. We then break out information about the tweet, like were there URLs in it? What are the URLs? Were there hashtags in it? What are the hashtags? And in doing that, we then summarize what's going on in the graph. We will build you a report about every person. We'll show you how they connect to their neighbors. We'll tell you about their degree. These are how many connections they've got. How many of those connections start somewhere else and arrive at them? That's their in degree. How many do they start and target at somebody else? Like how many times did they reply to somebody? That's their out degree. Uh, and so we have all of these columns of data. It just gets tossed into the spreadsheet for you. You can sort on it. You can filter it. If you're familiar with Excel, you're still in Excel. And so then you probably want to process it. You got all those raw edges. A follows B, A mentioned B, A um, uh, replied to B. And so you might then click a lot of buttons. You could calculate metrics. You could create groups. You could create the subgraph images. You could do all those things. Or you could hit the automate button. You just say, do it. Uh, I have a recipe. I've seen lots and lots and lots of Twitter graphs. There is no way that I could do to each graph what I do to each graph. It, it just takes too long. And so now I have a recipe, the Twitter recipe. And when I get Twitter data, I say, here's the Twitter recipe. I give both to Node Excel, and I say, go do it. And it does it. It just rips through this list of tasks. It just does it. And so if you'd rather not figure out all the details of all those tasks, Good idea. There are better things to do with your time. But you may still want the end result, which is a graph that tells a story. And so you run all that. Uh, it will calculate all these different me metrics for you. Uh, it will then allow you to define what gets mapped to what. What's color? What's size? What's you know, opacity? You tell me what label should be put on these things. And you do this with a drop down dialog. You just pick. Or don't do it at all. Just use one of the recipes. It picked for you. It'll build these little glyphs and then allow you to filter. And so notice the kinds of things that we can get out of Twitter. Some really interesting results. Like um, we'll, we'll certainly get how many followers you have and what's your in-degree and your out-degree and all of that stuff. But look at this stuff from Twitter. Uh, we'll get things like what time zone are you in? You know, you've gone to Twitter perhaps and you've logged in and it asks you, what time zone are you in? Uh, this is the, west, uh, the east coast of the United States of America. This is California. And that means this is Europe. And that means this is Asia. And this was a map talking about Obama. Guess where people talk, you know, of the people who talk about Obama, where are they? Uh, they're in the east coast of the United States and a little bit le less to the west, uh, but not so much in Europe, a little bit, but very, mu very little in Asia. And so we can see something about the actual geographic distribution of people in Twitter. We also see when did they join Twitter. And so these are people with a clue, and these are people who just caught one, right? I mean, if you've just joined Twitter, you're a little late, right? So these are the people who are a little late to the party. Now, admittedly, some of those accounts are accounts that people created recently for a conference or something like that. So it's OK to be late to the party in that sense. But you notice that there was a spike back here of by the time that spike ended, most of the people who are part of the advanced wave, the avant-garde, that was the end of the avant-garde. People had already come. They'd been there. So it's an easy thing to filter the, the data. And the results are something like this. I'm going to actually show you some live data now. Uh, here you go. This is the graph gallery. And using graph gallery, we can now point into data sets. And a feature we've just added, I'll show you. I think this will illustrate it very well. Uh, this is the topic pink slime. Everybody familiar with pink slime? Had any recently? Yeah. It's hard to avoid pink slime. Uh, so pink slime is finely textured beef product, an Orwellian term if ever there was one for offal mixed with ammonia, <laughs> which is what it is. It's the trimmings that you wouldn't otherwise eat uh, from the slaughterhouse floor. And pink slime is then uh, ground up, centrifuged, 
and then rinsed in an ammonium hydroxide bath to kill the bacteria. Mmm, good eating. And you know what? McDonald's just declared that it won't, won't be buying any more of it. <laughs> any more of it? Yes, that's right. That's what you've been eating at McDonald's for a long time. It's pink slime. Uh, it's the cheapest beef product you can get. And about uh, 2009, New York Times runs a headline uh, front page, Pink Slime. And it actually is quoting the word pink slime from uh, the Beef Products Industry Association, the guy who's the liaison. Boy, does he need a new job. He describes this product as pink slime. Uh, a year later, the celebrity chef Jamie Oliver puts up a YouTube video in which he decries pink slime, asks a butcher to come and bring these meat products, uh, puts them into a clear plastic tub, covers them with ammonia, runs it through a meat grinder, makes a hamburger patty, burn, you know, grills it, and then tries to serve it to his audience. And nobody will eat it. The, you know, it, it's a bad moment for the beef products uh, industry. This is people talking about pink slime. And people are talking about pink slime in Twitter. They're using the hashtag pink slime. But they're also using other hashtags. These are the hashtags that co-occur with pink slime. And what we can see is that um, different groups have clustered around different points of view different attitudes, orientations. And so if you see the pink slime and uh, there's a tag there, food revolution, and it's over there, uh, but not so, there it is over there. Uh, food revolution is the hashtag for this Jamie Oliver guy. He's a, uh, an advocate. He is a proponent of we should not eat pink slime. And you know there's a lot of debate over it, but uh, because some people are saying, well, if you don't eat the pink slime, we're going to have to kill another million and a half cows to fill the pink slime gap. And so it's complicated. Uh, it may in fact be the case that pink slime is healthier for you than filet mignon because they don't rinse your filet mignon in ammonia. Uh, who knew that ammonia was the best condiment to come along in a long time? Ketchup, a little bit of vinegar, and mm, some ammonia. Uh, in any case, this tag, pink slime, is a myth. Well, these are people who are apologists. These are defenders of pink slime. They are, no, oh, there we go. They are people who are from the industry. And so if you start seeing pro-pink slime, or what they like to call lean, finely textured beef product, uh, these are those people. And so if you were just to grab tweets at random and sample them to get the sense of the general tenor of how do fe people feel about pink slime, you might be sorely mistaken with your results if you brought more of them out of this cluster. Because this is the apologists for cluster. These are the advocates against cluster. And so we can actually see that out in social media, groups of people are forming. Not just a monolith, they're clustered. And we can now drill down into the tweets coming from that cluster and actually reveal who are these people. I'll show you another one that really illustrates this almost as well. Keystone XL, uh, no controversy there, right? Uh, so this is the, should we build a pipeline from Canada to take oil that's not sustainable and burn it in an economy that's not sustainable? The answer is, why not? Um, these are the against people. These were the four Keystone XL people. But then you look inside the four Keystone XL people and you find that they are mostly Canada uh, uh, accounts like TransCanada and Energy Nation. What did you think that they were going to be for? They're for Keystone XL. Uh, but it becomes very easy now to see that these are the people who are in this cluster and that they are not the people critical of Keystone XL, uh, which is largely accounts like uh, people who are talking about climate change and Mother Jones Magazine. These are people who are against Keystone XL. And so we can begin to see the landscape of public opinion as it forms in crowds in cyberspace. These are crowds that otherwise would have been invisible and are now visible and now possible to take pictures of those crowds with the equivalent of the Brownie Kodak camera you don't need to know what an f-stop is. Uh, you just have to press the shutter button. So I, I wish you good luck taking some good pictures. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to take any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, can you also use a movie?
so that you can look at how this developed. Yes. And also do reverse statistics to see what numbers occur as time proceeds. Yeah, uh, so okay. I can, will. <coughs> here's a hundred hours of Node Excel um, maps of. Um, the change in Wikipedia. Um, it's going to show up any second now, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Here you go. So this is uh, a little bit more painful to do, but yes, we can go in and show the edges arriving as people say, oh, guess what? Um, you know, there was no link between um, the page for Sendai and the page for Fukushima until after the 11th of March, 2011. Um, and here you can begin to see those edges be arriving. And so yes, uh, you also get a spreadsheet filled with metadata about the graph and you may do, you can export it to SPSS, you can, whatever you like with it. Yeah, so yes, the data is available for analysis. Sir? Um, there's something like this that, has, that was done back in 2008 with uh, Wikipedia mm -hmm. and they were tracking Vice presidential candidates for John McCain, mm -hmm. and uh, they were perking along and from, from various, from not to the sources in terms of the edits. And then, 72 hours before the announcement, um, the others died down, and uh, Sarah Palin spiked. Hmm. And so, it's a combination of activity, but also a combination of, of tracking the, the sources that uh, turn Wikipedia internally into a public uh, into a, a predictive model. Could be. I mean, uh, we tend to leak data in ways that were not expected. Um, I'll note that prior to um, the Gulf War, the number of pizza deliveries at the Pentagon spiked. Yes. And so now there are pizza ovens in the Pentagon. Should we ever need to go to war again, and if we ever get around to declaring one, uh, we will make our own pizzas, thank you, and not tip off whatever nation we're, you know, because no doubt somebody is watching Domino's in D.C. right now just to see how many pizzas get made. Uh, so yeah, there are lots of these indicators that leak, and maybe with better tools we can capture them. Yeah. So, man. It's great to see all the things that can be done. I'm curious about your sense of what is the, you know, a good time period for the sheets that were <coughs> in one snapshot. Yeah, I can show you that. Um, it really depends on the nature of the query. And so, for example, here is uh, a map of a topic. It's called SochBiz. So this is the idea of using Facebook-like tools inside the firewall, social business. And here, it'll show you that our first tweet in this graph was on the 12th, and the last one was on the 16th. And so therefore, we've got about four days, five days of data in there. There are topics that are fast moving. So World Cup, Whitney Houston, uh, Romney, uh, these topics on certain days will generate on the order of a few thousand tweets a second. And as a result, this tool, which reaches into Twitter and asks it the basic question it allows you to ask, which is, can I have any tweets that you have on X? And Twitter replies with, yes, you can. Here are up to, but not exceeding, 1,500 tweets. That's the most number of tweets it will return to you from Twitter. And so the, the answer is, how long did it take to generate 1,500 tweets? For SochBiz, it took four or five days. And then didn't even make it, I think. Yeah, uh, let's see, there were not that many tweets in here. So by comparison, a, a fast-moving topic will exhaust that in minutes, sometimes seconds, making it so that, like a camera, the metaphor kind of works, um, it has a shutter speed. And some events move too quickly for it to be captured by this camera. And we are still at the, the, the world of slightly slow film, right? We haven't gotten up to super fast film and fast shutters. We're still at that Brownie Kodak camera era. 
But uh, imagine what happens next. You get digital camera, you get a flip, and then you get an iPhone, and then cameras disappear. I like the overlay of the tree graph that you have. Oh, yeah, here. yeah, yeah. And uh, for uh, those of you, I, I think it's worth that, and I, I will let people know that um, your tree graphs of Usenet hmm. uh, quite some time ago um, are in the um, Math Hall of Fame, Visualization Hall of Fame. Hmm. And um, I can get one of those up really quickly. Yeah, hang on a second. Um, I think all I have to do is go down here, go to Flickr. And you, and would you like have that overlay on top of the uh, network analysis. It's really cool because the network then lay itself out related right. to the tree graph. That's right. That's exactly what it does now. So we, we're, we're doing a mashup of a tree map. And I think you wanted to see this. Let's see. Uh, that, that's what you would like to see, one of these. Um, this is a tree map. And a, a tree map is a way of visualizing a hierarchy, a very dense hierarchy. And this uh, was now 12 years ago. This is a map of a thing called Usenet. And some people remember Usenet. I like to call it the used to use net. Um, people say, oh, yes, I used to use Usenet. Um, it was where you would go to post messages and have threaded conversations before things that we now take for granted as the firmament of the internet, like Facebook and YouTube and Flickr and Twitter. They didn't exist. Imagine. <laughs> and uh, you had Usenet, and it was a place to go and post messages and get a reply. And it had places like rec.pets.cats. Anybody remember rec.pets.cats? And so in here somewhere is uh, the rec hierarchy, and within it would be the pets hierarchy, and within that would be the cats, uh, well, within pets would be cats, and so you would have nested boxes. And this is a technique that was developed by um, Professor Ben Schneiderman, a uh, computer science professor at the University of Maryland in the early 90s. He wanted to visualize um, the amount of space on his hard disk. Because it was back when hard disks could uh, achieve the state called full. And now when they achieve that state, we, we have another process called replacement. And you just get another disk, it's, it's twice as the size, and you copy all your files over. But in the old days, you actually had to go and find the bigger files that you didn't need anymore and delete them in order to reclaim space. And so what you wanted to see was uh, both the hierarchical location and the file size in one display. And Professor Schneiderman came up with this insight that nested boxes, which would, in some ways, you could call this a squarified pie chart that has a pie chart within each wedge. So it's a nested, squarified pie chart. And it turns out to be one of the most effective ways for visualizing very large-scale hierarchies. And this tool is still available on the web, and there are many, many other implementations that will take any hierarchy you have and very quickly visualize it. And you'll notice that we could then use color to show change over time. So dark green was growth and red was decline. And out of potentially tens of thousands of items, you have a pre-attentive visual system that, in less than 300 milliseconds, can find the reddest object in the screen, which is a really nifty thing that evolution gave us. Uh, it came to us by way of the which bit of the fruit is ripe task. So find the red berry is the task that we were designed for. We're now finding the red berry, um, only it's a data landscape and, and not. So you're taking that network, so that's really right. We're now applying, we're mashing up tree maps with, um, with networks. Yeah. Other questions? Sir, yeah. This is uh, mostly uh, a US phenomenon in terms of using these tools, using social media, since there's more data, there's more stuff available in the US. The government provides more open data, more so than in Europe. Or are, you, are, there, are these things appearing everywhere? Uh, I will say that the U.S. leads but is quickly overtaken. Yeah, um, The dominant language on the Internet is no longer English. It's Mandarin. Um, the number of tweets that come from outside the U.S. is significant. 
Um, the growth rate for user populations is growing faster outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. in part because we've, for the most part, saturated. Everybody who wants to tweet has already tweeted. Um, only about 13% of the U.S. population is on Twitter whereas a significantly higher fraction is in Facebook, because Facebook for many people has replaced email, and email is something people cannot live without. So um, I would say that the most profound uses of the tool probably are not in the US, in part because in the US we do have alternative channels for communication. There is a semi-open press. There are channels uh, uh, for dissemination. You can use the mails. You can get a, a message out. Uh, in other societies where there are far fewer opportunities for public discourse, uh, social media has a disproportionate importance. Uh, so it is not the case that in Tunisia, no one had ever protested the government before. It happened a lot. It was just that in Tunisia, this last go around, a lot of those protests were videotaped and uploaded to YouTube, where it was much harder for people from the center to ignore the protest at the periphery. So I would actually say it, it seems to have a greater impact outside the U.S. Do you think the Chinese government would be concerned about the tool using the uh, tool? Oh, well, yeah, there's that. Well, the Chinese government has already figured out a few things better than a lot of us. Um, are you familiar with the term the water army? No? Uh, the water army is a group of Chinese people who are paid by the post, by the Chinese government, to seek out and flood all unpatriotic opinion. And so if you say things like, I think we could perform better if we applied some other method of governance, um, that would be a very dangerous opinion to have. Uh, many people will show up in your forum and they will denounce you, they will provide alternative opinions, and they will so drown you out that you have flooded the opinion space. And there are enough people who are happy to earn 50 cents a posting um, to ensure that we will have discipline. And so, no, an open internet is not uh, a guarantee, and even an open internet is not a guarantee of liberty. You know, we're going to have to work for it. How different is the format of QQ to uh, Twitter, for example? Does Ken Bosen break QQ? Uh, so QQ, Weibo, uh, th there are lots of these, all, all, you know, it's not that in China they don't tweet, they just don't use Twitter to do it. Uh, and Weibo, um, as a domestic Chinese company, simply does not have the kinds of concerns that, let's say, a Google or a Twitter has about censorship, which is to say that we only like to censor things that our government tells us to censor and not what other governments tell us to censor. Uh, so how different are they? They're not that different. Could we build interfaces to them? Certainly. Uh, would anybody like to help support us do that? That would be great. We would love to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, I thank you so much. I'm happy to hang around. I appreciate your time. I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much.